This is called exact change. You know, exacting something is to draw it out, to pull it out. And how many know that when God wants change, He exacts change? Second Kings 5. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable. I like that. I like that the Bible mentions that. Because by him the Lord had given deli deliverance unto Syria. And he was also a mighty man in valor, very brave, very courageous, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that it was in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus and the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and he took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, and now when the letter has come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him from leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel read the letter that he read his clothes, and he said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man does send me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see that he's seeking a quarrel against me. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard the king of Israel had rent his clothes. He sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. You know, I was thinking this morning, this, this sermon means so much to me. I was thinking that one of the things that the church doesn't recognize easily is moves of God. The church has a hard time realizing when God brings change. All through the, the <clears throat> last, I don't know, thousand years of the church, there has been tremendous amount of change. And it's almost like we believe that we are at the end of change and that change is over and that we've arrived. And so it's really hard for us to think reformation. It's really hard for us to believe that God wants to see reform in the church. You know, out of the last 200 years, probably the greatest preacher from 1844 to 1924 was Mariah Adder, who saw great, amazing moves of God in her ministry. Amazing. Some of the most powerful moves of God. We think Smith Wigglesworth or John G. Lake. We think of the big names, but Mariah Adder was literally... One of the greatest uh, uh, carriers of the presence and the power of God that we've seen in the last 200 years. And the reason they say that she was such an amazing presence of God and such an amazing power of God was she moved with the times. When God would move, she would move. She was never afraid of change, but continually embraced, welcomed it, and saw God move. So Naaman... The Syrian general goes to the house of Elisha, the prophet, where he receives instruction. The prophet welcomes this man to his house by not even going out to greet him. In fact, the Bible says he sends a servant out to Naaman to tell him. A lowly slave, a servant. And he says, tell Naaman this uh, Syrian general that he is to go dip himself seven times in the Jordan River. This is the instruction by Elisha. After the bath, his leprosy is healed. And Naaman is so happy that he offers Elisha a reward. Look at 2 Kings 5, starting at verse 15. He returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and he stood before him and he said, Behold, now I know that there's no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant, 
But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And Naaman said, shall there not then, I pray, thee be given to thy servant two mules burdens of earth? For thy servant will from now on offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant. When my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. There's so much in this scriptures I want to show you. <clears throat> Naaman comes to Elisha and he offers this huge gift to the prophet. But the prophet refuses the gift because the Lord tells him not to take it. He hears the voice of God. And normally I'm sure he would have said, wow, thanks. But the Lord had told him not to take it. Then there was a reason. How many know that everything God does, he does with a purpose? Yeah. Everything. Naaman said these words. This is exactly what he said. I just want to bless you. He said, let me give you a blessing. That's the exact words he used even in Hebrew. Let me give you a blessing. I wonder how many Christians would have completely missed the voice of God because they would have been uh, given into Naaman's words when he said, let me bless you. Take a blessing from your servant. Hear Elisha. God wants to bless you. That's what he said. It's exactly his words. Christians would have reasoned. I can't stop him from receiving a blessing. He's sowing into my life. If I refuse to take it, I'll rob him of a harvest. How many would have, have ever heard those words? <clears throat> How many know that Elisha isn't guided by any spiritual sounding rhetoric? He hears God's voice over all the Christian nomenclature of the day. Even the words here, let me sow into your ministry. Let me bless you. So Naaman says, from now on, I'm going to sacrifice to your God. Why? Because your God succeeded where my gods failed. Your God is a God of power. Naaman is a man of war. Naaman is a man of power. Naaman is a man that, that honors. And Naaman recognizes authority. From now on, I'm going to sacrifice to the Lord of Israel. Now, <clears throat> you can read a lot of commentary on the situation. And all that I read are wrong. They just aren't. They say that Naaman, listen, this is amazing because Christians always think Christian-y. It's true. When a, when a Christian reads this story, and I read commentary after commentary, and they all say that Naaman became a believer, but they condemn him for compromising his newfound beliefs. He, they condemn him. Why? Because he says, but well, when I go into Rimmon, the god of the Syrians, and my master leans on my arm, I've got to kneel too. And so they're, they're all running him down and they say, yes, Naaman had a, a life-changing experience and Naaman was saved and, and he gave his heart to the <laughs> Lord at that moment, and, and, but he's compromising them. So how many know that compromise became part of of the Christian cliche words of the 70s and 80s. Compromise was something that we heard preached on a lot about riding the fence. How many have ever heard somebody talk about, you'll be sore if you ride the fence? <laughs> the word compromise means agreement, understanding. It means middle ground or happy medium. That's what you call a, a, a well-off fortune teller, a happy medium. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> and so all, all through those years we were taught to despise the middle of the road mentality how many have ever heard that the middle of the road mentality and there were multitudes of sermons preached I remember multitudes about riding the fence and driving down the middle of the road and how dangerous that is so out of all the anti-compromise movement came this 
fanatical Christian mentality that developed into a cliche that said a fanatic is someone who loves Jesus more than you do. How many have ever heard that? How many know what a fanatic really is? A fanatic is an extremist, a radical, or a zealot. There's no compromise in the heart of a fanatic, nor is there any ability to reason with the person who's fanatical. How many have ever seen these Antifa people? How many have ever listened to people talk to them? They don't have any answers. They just don't have any reason. The danger of fanaticism is that the extremists cannot hear the voice of God because their ways become a series of knee-jerk reactions. Let me bless you. It must be God. I want to sow into your ministry. It has to be God. We're broke. So, so away. <clears throat> Knee jerk is an immediate, unthinking, emotional reaction produced by an event or a statement to which the reacting person is highly sensitive and all they got to hear is the right words and they re react. Let me ask you this. Was Elisha a non-compromising fanatic? Not at all. Amazingly, when you see Elisha in this story, he's not, he looks nothing like Christianity. He's directed by the voice of God alone. When Naaman said, I want to bless your ministry, he heard God say, not this time. No matter what you offer, I see all that gold, all that silver, all those fine clothes. We're broke. We got bad clothes. You got everything you want to give it to us. And God says, not this time. What did He, he didn't even be, hesitate. He said, nope. Ain't touching it. Can't touch that. So what makes me know that Elisha isn't fanatical? Look at verse 18. He says, um... But unto the Lord in this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant. That when my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. How would a Christian have responded to that request? Um, my wife is a Baal worshiper, and she really wants me to go to the temple of Baal with her every week. And so when I go in with her and I bow before Baal with her, could you please pardon me? What would a Christian have said? You're going to burn in hell. <laughs> Naaman would have received his first sermon on coming out from among them and being separate. You've got to separate yourself. Wouldn't he have? Not that they heard it from God, but they heard it. And it became a knee-jerk reaction because they heard it over and over until there was no God communication. It was just an immediate response. How many things do you just immediately respond because Christianity told you this is the way it is? It wasn't like, I don't even need to wait for God's voice. I already know the answer. A Christian would have told him about worldly influence and the great potential to backslide. Why? Because Christianity doesn't understand the way of the kingdom. Let's look deeper. How's that sound? Naaman's name in Hebrew means pleasant and agreeable, which is bizarre because he's a Syrian. He has a Hebrew name, which means meek. Remember, it's the meek that inherit the earth. It's odd that this Syrian general has a Hebrew name, but somehow God worked it out. How do we know that Naaman lives up to his name? Look at 2 Kings 5, starting at verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha, and Elisha sent a messenger to him and said, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will come again to thee, and you'll be clean. Naaman was angry. How many have ever been angry? It's like, this doesn't make any sense. Did you ever just get angry? It's like, this doesn't make sense to me. And he went away and he said, behold, I thought he would come out to me and he would stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, strike his hand, lay hands on the sick and recover the leper. Aren't a are, uh, man and far from the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? 
May I not wash in them and be clean? And he turned around and he went away in a rage. Now listen, his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, I love this servant. If the prophet had asked you to do some great thing, stand on your head, dress like both people, and top of Mount Everest. <laughs> That's in the original Hebrew. <laughs> Wouldn't you have done it? How much rather than when he says to you, says to you just go wash and be clean. So Naaman went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. According to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. This is a man who can move past his emotions and be persuaded by the voice of wisdom. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Everybody gets mad. Everybody gets emotional. And God knew that about Naaman, but he had that servant right there beside him. A slave with a crummy job. But that slave with a crummy job knew wisdom. And he says to Naaman, he didn't ask you to do anything hard. He just said, go take a bath in the river. What's it going to hurt? Yeah. And amazingly, Naaman is swayed by this man's voice. Why? Because meekness is passionate yet complete. God can work with those who are compassionate yet com or who are passionate yet compliant. Here's what you need to understand. Naaman <coughs> believed in the God of Judaism, didn't he? The God of Israel, the God of the Jew. But Naaman didn't become a Jew. Now I'll begin to take my bar mitzvah, and from then on I'll do the Passover and feasts. And he didn't, did he? He didn't become a Jew. He just recognized and honored the God of the Jew. Elisha didn't have to pray a prayer or ask for forgiveness for this man's sins. He didn't say you need to get on your knees right now, Naaman, and repent of your sin and tell God you're sorry and weep a little. We want to see some tears. He didn't say you need to be remorseful and ask forgiveness. He didn't invite Jehovah to come into his heart. He simply makes a declaration of honor. Look at verse 17 again. Naaman said, Shall there not then I pray thee be given to thy servant two mules burdens of earth? For thy servant will from now on offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto any other god but unto His offerings, he wasn't offering sin offerings. What was he offering? He was offering offerings of honor, thanks, and reverence to the God who is the most powerful God in his life. I will honor your God with thank offerings from now on. That's what he said. How many understand that a king will respond positively to the honor of the strong? over the contrition of the weak. A strong king always responds to the honor of the strong. And he always responds more positively to that than over the contrition of the weak. God will always honor praise and thanksgiving over contrition. Look at Jeremiah Thou hast forsaken me, says the Lord. Thou art gone back. <coughs> Therefore will I stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I'm weary with repenting. The literal translation in the Hebrew says, I am so sick of pitying and comforting. I've had a belly full of your I'm sorry's. That's what God said. He's talking to his people. Naaman is an honorable man who absolutely understands the way of honor. Look at 2 Kings uh, 5, 18 and 19 again. In this thing, the Lord pardon your servant that when my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon. When I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon my servant in this thing. 
Look what Elisha says. And he said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. When I'm serving Ben Hadad, who is my king, and we're together in the house of the Syrian idol women, this is what he said. Will your God Jehovah pardon me? How many know whenever he's in the house, he's not there to honor the idol women. He's there to honor his king. How many understand that um, honor honors? There's a lot of fake honor. There's a lot of pretense in honor. Honor honors. When he said, I'm honoring you by asking you if I can continue to honor my king, that your God would pardon me if I honor my king. And Elisha said unto him one word, Shalom. All's well. That's what he said. All's well. This is literally off the change anti-Christian. But it is absolutely kingdom authority. Can I show you something? How many like stuff that's hard to swallow? <laughs> You're just going to have to chew. Matthew 9. There is so much in this. When, when, when I show you the end. Sorry. <laughs> There's such a... This, did you ever watch a movie and in the end you were shocked and went, that's this sermon. And he entered into a ship and he passed over and came to his own city. And behold, they brought him a man sick of the palsy, lying on the bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins are forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Your sins be forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk. But that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then said he unto the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go to thy house. And he arose, and he departed to his house. And when the multitude saw it, they marveled, and they glorified God, which had given such power unto men. This is the kingdom authority of the kingdom ambassador. Jesus came to represent God absolutely. On earth as it is in heaven. Colossians 1 says that Jesus is the exact likeness of the unseen God. The visible representation of the invisible. Isn't that awesome? How many believe that as a believer, you have been called as an ambassador of Christ? How many are afraid to answer that question? But Paul says exactly that in 2 Corinthians 5. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. We are ambassadors. He said, be reconciled unto God. Now, if you were to read that, or if you were to have some preacher preach that to you, be reconciled unto God, um, he would try to tell you how that means that you need to be a good Christian, act like a good Christian, live like a good Christian. That's literally, it doesn't mean that at all. <clears throat> it literally means, when Paul said it, as Jesus was an exact representation of the will of God, now you are to be an exact representation of the will of God. That's what be reconciled unto God means. It means now it's your turn. How many know that there's, there's got to be more? How many know that we, we, we need a move of God? Everybody, when, when Martin Luther discovered the book of Ephesians, everybody you know, lost their minds because now we're saved by grace. And then we just work that out a little bit and here we are. How many know it's time for another move of God? It's time to go another step into the kingdom and the things of God. But it's hard for people to change. People don't like change. They sing, 
I surrender all to you, but I don't want to change. I surrender, but I don't change. So Elisha gives name and get this, you ready? Sin exemption. He said, will the Lord pardon me? He said, you're forgiven. Did he ask God? He just said, you're forgiven, didn't he? Let me pray about that. <laughs> Let me pray about that because we got to know God's heart on this. So what he said, did he? He said, all's well. So Elisha gives name and sin exemption, and then Jesus does it for the palsy guy. How is that? Jesus gives the palsy guy who doesn't even <laughs> ask. The guy's laying there. He might have been suffering lockjaw. He doesn't even say a word. He's just laying there. Jesus walks up to him and says, Hey, bud, your sins are forgiven. <coughs> Is that against the rules? Who makes up these rules? Jesus, you're making them up as you go along. Isn't it true? Does it shock you that somebody would have their sins forgiven that doesn't ask? <coughs> Does it shock you that he has the power to forgive sins? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? It's the same thing Jesus said. Thanks the same thing happening. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Look at John 20. This is something that you don't like. This is a scripture that every preacher comes out of their Bible. Then the same day of the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst. And he said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they're remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, they're retained. We don't do that. We don't believe in that. We speak in tongues, but that's as far as we go. <laughs> Mind blown. Jesus said this. With the same authority bestowed on me by my Father as his exact representation on earth, so send I you. <coughs> Elisha healed Naaman, didn't he? And he forgave his sins. Jesus healed the palsy guy. And he forgave his sins. Then he gave all of his disciples, his representatives, the same authority. <coughs> Does that scare anyone? Does that kind of power scare you? How many know you've got to hear from God? How many know you can't just hear from Christians? Because how many know you can't hear from your soul either? <coughs> I hate them. I'm going to send them to hell. <laughs> right? You'd be sending people to hell every day. Your sins are retained. Your sins are retained. You, I forgive. Yours are retained. <laughs> so Elisha sends Naaman on his way home. It's weird. He doesn't tell him to change his life. Doesn't hand him a pocket Old Testament <laughs> containing all the books of the law. He just sends him on his way home, doesn't he? <coughs> kind of like Jesus when he delivered the gathering. He just said, No, go home. The guy says, I want to follow you. Jesus says, No, go home. I don't want you to follow me. Get away from me. You ever have people like that? Mm -hmm. Just get away from me. <laughs> Stop following me. <laughs> Second Kings 5. Have you ever heard of Gehazi? Uh -huh. The servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman the Syrian, 
and not receiving in his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord lives, I'm going to run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from his chariot to meet him. And he said, is all well? And he said, all is well. My master sent me, saying, behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Naaman said, be content. Take two talents. And he urged him. And he found two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments. And he laid them upon two of his servants, and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand, and he bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go, and they departed. But he went in, and he stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, Whence comest thou, Gazi? Where were you? And he said, Thy servant was no wither. I went no wither. I loved him. And he said unto him, Went not my heart with you when the man turned again from his chariot to meet you? Is this a season for receiving money and receiving garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servant? I mean, he's like, you're blowing it out of proportion, man. <laughs> then look what he says to Gehazi. The leprosy, therefore, of Naaman shall cleave unto you and unto your seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. Gehazi appears scripturally to be one of the most pathetic of all the servants of God. He appears to have traded his health and his relationship with God for a little bit of blame. Verse 27 is poorly translated and it's hard to understand. It literally says, you and your children will be lepers from now to the end of your lives. How many would say that Gehazi got what he deserved? You know, Christianity would say that judgment came to Gehazi's house because the wages of sin is death. How many know that Christians are literally some of the least empathetic people on the globe? When it comes to judgment, we're so quick to say, they deserve that. They're going to hell. Yeah, well, they deserve hell. Right? They get what they deserve. The wages of sin is death. But let me ask you this question. Would you consider this punishment a bit extreme? Gehazi didn't kill anyone. He's not a murderer. Did David end up a leper because of killing Uriah and taking his wife? David didn't end up with lepers. Can you imagine being the rotting, dying, parts falling off, fingers rotting off, the feet rotting down to stumps, the face distorted from rotting? It's a terrible way to die. Terrible. So Gehazi gets this extreme judgment. He didn't kill anyone. He's literally not even an evil man. <clears throat> it wasn't like he was robbing Naaman, was it? Was he robbing Naaman? Wasn't Naaman offering the money? Wasn't Naaman offering the clothes? In fact, Naaman was so happy to give a blessing to Elisha's ministry, he literally gave Gehazi double what he had. Literally, he wanted to give it. He was asking for someone to take it. Gehazi was just opening up a door for him to be blessed. Gehazi deceived Naaman, and for that he and his kids are sentenced to the slow, miserable death sentence that comes with leprosy? Gehazi is a servant of Elisha. He's probably dirt poor. They probably 
probably struggle to eat. They probably struggle to pay bills. They probably struggle just to get clothes to wear. He's a servant of a prophet. It's not a rich ministry. It's a prophet. Is this the will of God that this man would die like this? That he would suffer like this? Is this God's will? How many knows that God's ways are nothing like our ways? How many understand that God thinks kingdom and we think Christian? This entire scenario, in fact, I didn't even know this except God told me all this. This is such an amazing scenario. <clears throat> the entire scenario is a prophetic type. Gehazi is the servant of Elisha. He's been specifically chosen from the sons of the prophets, which was a group that supported Elijah and Elisha. How many remember reading about the sons of the prophets? These were young men that were not Levites. So they weren't part of the Levitical priesthood. These were just called the sons of the prophets. They weren't Levites. They were, they were all prophetic. All these men were prophetic. Remember when the young man said, Do you know the Lord is going to take your master away from you? And Elijah, and Elijah Elisha said to him, Yes, I know. Get away from me. Remember? Did you know that the Lord's going to take your master? Yes, I already heard that. These men were prophetic. Gehazi was probably the top of the class. Why? Because he became Elisha's servant. He became Elijah's Elisha. He was the servant of the greatest prophet on the face of the earth. Probably next in line for the ministry. Prophetic, top of the class, godly young man. When we look at Gage, we think, what a piece of garbage. But you've got to look at the background to know why he is where he is. They weren't Levites. They committed their whole lives to seeking to hear the voice of God. I think that probably at one time he had said I surrender all to God I surrender all I believe that he was a passionate standout among the rest of the sons of the prophets. And because of this, he was chosen by Elisha. His name is Hebrew. Gehazi means a narrow prophetic perception. He can hear God. One thing you've got to know is that Gehazi was only in the position that he was in because Gehazi loved God. Gehazi loved God, and so he was chosen to be where he was. We judge quickly, don't we? Yeah. <clears throat> if I ask you that, how many would say, yes, Dan, I have <clears throat> surrendered my life to the Lord. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. You sing that and you worship and you believe it when you sing it. Let me ask you this question. Do you think that if Peter had known he was going to be crucified with his wife naked hanging in front of the Romans, that he would have given up his fishing business? Do you think Peter, if he would have seen the end of his life while he and his, what, while he and his wife were crucified side by side. They said his wife cried out, Remember the Lord, Peter. Remember the Lord as she said, I'm dying beside him. Do 
you think he would have given up his boat, or do you think he might have just looked down, pretending to tie knots while Jesus walked by? Do you think that if Gehazi would have seen himself as this rotting, walking corpse of a human being, that he might have just quietly stayed at home, minding his own business, tending to the farm of his father? You might say Peter's different. Gehazi made a choice to accept a gift from Naaman. And he was judged for his sin. Why would you say that? Because you're a Christian. <laughs> but if you said, I surrender all to Jesus, doesn't that mean that he has the right to do with you whatever he wants? It's a hard question. They understand that in God's dictionary the words human rights doesn't exist. We have human rights, but not God doesn't see it that way. Just the nation. Let me ask you this. If God's will for your life was to slowly die as a vile leper, are you still surrendered? If God's will for your life was to be dragged naked through the streets and nailed to a cross, to die groaning in agony, while your enemies mocked and made fun of you, are you still surrendered? Or did you just sign on for the easy life of blessing and comfort? Did you only surrender your sin in exchange for His goodness? Or did you actually surrender all? Nathan Hale was a soldier in the Continental Army during the <clears throat> American Revolution. I love this young man. He was a, became a spy for the Americans. George Washington said he needed a spy to get, gather information and go to New York because the British had come. And he said it's going to be a really dicey assignment. He said whoever accepts it, nobody wanted it. But Nathan Hale stepped forward and volunteered. It was an intelligence gathering mission. But he was captured by the British and he was sentenced to be executed. Before being hanged on September 22nd, 1776, his last words were recorded by Captain John Montresso, who was a British captain. The British captain said this, on the morning of Captain Hale's execution, my station was near the fatal spot, and I requested the provost marshal to permit the prisoner to sit in my marquee while he was making necessary preparations. Captain Hale entered. He was calm, and he bore himself with gentle dignity. He asked for writing materials, which I furnished him. He wrote two letters, one to his mother and one to a brother officer. That he had been, that he had been uh, with, stationed with while he was in school. Then he was summoned shortly thereafter to the gallows. There were only a few persons around him, and yet his characteristic dying words were remembered when he said, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. He was 21. surrender his life for the lowly cause of the country and not even for the high cause of the kingdom. This man, Nathan Hale, went to Yale at 14. He was a genius. When the man in charge, the British man in charge, read his letters, he tore them up. He said, I don't want the rebels to ever know that such a brave man existed among them. Look at 1 Corinthians 6. <clears throat> what 
don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. How many believe this? When you gave your life to Christ, was it for his will and for his pleasure? When you made the decision to follow Jesus, did you count the cost? When you said, I surrender all to you, how much is all? Gehazi wasn't a Levite. Gehazi wasn't a priest. Gehazi was a volunteer. He voluntarily gave his life to serve Elisha. And I believe when he did, God took him seriously. He was joyfully and faithfully serving God by assisting the prophet. He was experiencing the power and the presence of God by serving the prophet. He had the joy and the peace that passes understanding. He probably considered himself the most blessed human being on earth because he got to serve the Lord by personally serving the most powerful man of God on the face of the earth. And suddenly, in one moment of weakness, he makes a decision that irreversibly alters his life. And now, he is what he appears to be. He's a cursed leper. He surrendered his life to God, and now he's become nothing but hopeless. Second Corinthians 7. And there were four lepers sitting at the end of the gate. And they said one to another, why sit here until we die? If we say we enter into the city, the famine's in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come, let us fall into the host of the Syrians. For if they save us alive, we live. But if they kill us, we'll just die. And they rose up in the twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they came to the outermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there wasn't anyone there. But the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and horses and the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Look, the king of Israel hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and they fled in the twilight. They left the tents and the horses, their asses, even the camp as it was, and they fled for their life. And when the lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into a tent and they ate and they drank. They carried from their silver and gold and raiment. And they went and they hid it. And they came again and entered into another tent and carried from there. And they went and they hid it. And they said one to another, We don't do well. This day is a day of good tidings. We hold our peace and tarry no morning light. Some mischief is going to come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called to the porter of the city. And they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians. And behold, there wasn't anyone there. Neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house with them. <laughs> Jewish history records that this is Gehazi, who's three seconds. The four lepers men, who God positioned. God strategically placed the hazy who had surrendered his life to God and his three sons outside the gate to deliver the kingdom of Samaria. How many understand that God's ways are not blind our own? Christianity says this, and I hate it when they say this. In fact, I, every Christian says this, I always have my fist strong. <laughs> because
Because Christianity would say, well, God took a bad situation and he brought good out of it. Christianity would say, Gehazi sinned and he failed in his call, but God used him anyway. Gehazi didn't fail in his call. This was his call. He could have been positioned here. God needed a leopard to man the gate because God needed a middleman to go between. God needed an ambassador to fill his yes. <clears throat> Ask yourself, would I actually be willing to give my life like a hazy just to satisfy the will of God? Would I give up all my earthly comfort to see the kingdom of God expressed on earth as it is in heaven. Do you count your life as your own? Or do you truly count it as God's? See, it's easy to look at your life and to say, everything's against me. God must think pretty low of me to place me in this position. If you were Gehazi, wouldn't you have thought that? That you had surrendered everything. You surrendered your entire life to serve this man of God. And now you, because of one what seems to be a mistake, you end up a leper, hopeless, in a really bad situation. But how many know that God sees the beginning from the end? And God saw Gehazi... And you know what he said? Here's a man who surrendered his heart to me. And you know what? I believe him. I believe him. And so God positioned him, Gehazi, as a leper. With his four sons. Or three sons, rather. Gehazi and his three sons. Can you imagine how bitter they must have felt toward their dad? They did nothing. surrender all. We're thinking all the bad stuff I've surrendered. <laughs> but he's actually talking about your will. You know, the valley of the shadow of death is literally that. It's the valley of the shadow of death where I feel hopeless and helpless and broken. And like some days you can almost not even go another step. But you signed on for this. You were a volunteer. You weren't born into the priesthood. You weren't born a Levite. You volunteered for the position. Just like Gehazi. And just like Peter. Yeah. Amen. Stand with me. Praise God. Father, I believe that in this last day you will exact a change of You will draw it out of us. I believe that. No matter what the cost. And we've said that. Whatever the cost. No matter what the cost. And then when the cost comes, we complain about the cost. When we see the price, we complain about the price. This is too much. You're asking too much. We didn't expect it when we said all that you would demand all. But he's God. And if he wants all, he takes all. He's God. And it's his own will. And his own pleasure. And his own plan. And Father, we honor you as God. Even as Naaman the leper, we honor you as God. We honor you with our thanks and our praise. 
because you're God, regardless of what we are involved in, regardless if it's a hopeless situation, regardless of what it is, we offer you praise because you placed us here. Yeah. We have to believe that because we said we surrender to you, and you said, okay, then I place you here. So we receive that. We accept that. And we say, Thy will be done. Yes. On earth as it is in heaven, Thy will be done. Let us be a thankful people. Let us be a people that offers a sacrifice of praise, even in the time when you're exacting change from us. And regardless of how it ends, regardless, we refuse to back down. And our only regret is that we only have one life to lose for the kingdom. Let us be courageous, even as these men were. And we'll give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name.